It's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce to you Professor John T. Jost. He is the Associate Professor of Psychology at New York University, where he is a faculty affiliate at the Institute for Law and Society, as well as for the Center on Experimental Social Science. Um, he holds an AB in Psychology from Duke University, an MA in Philosophy from the University of Cincinnati, and a PhD in Social Psychology from Yale University where his dissertation was about in-group and out-group favoritism among groups differing in socioeconomic success. Um, his honors and awards are far too numerous to mention in their completeness today, um, but he most recently received the Morton Deutsch Award for distinguished contributions to overcoming oppression and sustaining justice. Um, his books and articles are also too numerous, but maybe most relevant is the one that's listed um, and linked to um, at the Situationist website entitled um, System Justification Theory and Research, Implications for Law, Legal Advocacy, and Social Justice. Uh, we feel very privileged to have speaking to us today someone doing this kind of important research, um, exploring the theoretically complex but critical nexus that exists between who we are as persons and how legal systems affect us as such. So please join me in welcoming Professor John Jost. Thank you for that very kind and generous uh, introduction. It's, um, it's definitely a pleasure for me to be here today, even on my wedding anniversary. Uh, so I thank uh, John and, uh, and, and Michael and others um, who were involved in uh, pulling this together and, and bringing me here today. Uh, and just to tell you what a, what a great guy uh, John is, in case you don't already know, but you probably do, uh, when I got to my hotel last night, there was a bucket of champagne there for my wife and myself, which we will enjoy tonight. So thank you for that as well, John. Um, for several years, uh, my colleagues and I have been consumed with, some might say obsessed with, um, one major question, which uh, has often been asked by historians and social scientists, and which has a number of more or less interchangeable versions. Uh, the question is, at least one form of the question is, uh, why do people so often tolerate injustice and exploitation rather than doing everything in their power to make a change? Why do we acquiesce when we could at least conceivably take part in changing the status quo and creating a better, more just system or situation? The historical record, as you know, reveals a staggering number of instances of decent people not merely passively accepting, but sometimes even actively justifying and rationalizing egregiously unjust social systems. The caste system in India has survived largely intact for 3,000 years, with 150 million Indians today declared untouchables. The institution of slavery, of course, survived for more than 400 years in Europe and the Americas. Colonialism was also practiced for centuries and still is in some places, as is slavery. And the apartheid system in South Africa lasted for 46 years. Uh, Jennifer Eberhardt and Larry Bobo today, among others, have already shown us incarceration statistics for our society. Uh, and I want to add just a few uh, poverty statistics to that as well. Uh, uh, today, 12.5 uh, million children are living in poverty, including 29% of all Latino children and 33% of African American children. One eighth of all Americans live below the poverty line, while at the same time, the combined net worth of the 400 wealthiest Americans exceeds $1 trillion. CEOs today earn approximately 500 times the salary of their average employee. Most theories in the social and behavioral sciences, especially those that stress either individual or collective self-interest as primary motives, would predict that there would be widespread protest, rebellion, and moral outrage. But this is not what we see. Uh, as the late Harvard historian Barrington Moore Jr. Uh, wrote, uh, the human capacity to withstand suffering uh, and abuse is impressive, tragically so. Those few who do try to bring about qualitative social change are, generally speaking, not the ones who would benefit the most from it, and they're frequently subjected to ridicule and hostility for their efforts. Moral outrage, in other words, is more easily directed at those who dare to challenge the system than at those who are responsible for its failings. The poet 
uh, the poet a a a W. H. Auden, I think, ex exercised great uh, social psychological insight uh, into this general problem when he wrote that there is a merciful mechanism in the human mind that prevents one from knowing how unhappy one is. One only realizes it if the unhappiness passes and then one wonders how on earth one was ever able to stand it. If the factory workers once got out of factory life for six months, there would be a revolution such as the world has never seen. This mechanism, like rationalization in general, is indeed merciful in certain psychological respects because it helps us to cope with and adapt to unwelcome realities. But it's also potentially treacherous at the societal level insofar as it undermines the motivation to press for progress and social change. My colleagues and I essentially have been stalking uh, Auden's merciful mechanism now for more than a decade. And if nothing else, we've given it a name. And the name is system justification. So specifically, in collaboration with Mazarin Banaji and Brian Nosik, among others, uh, I've argued that in addition to well-known motives for ego and group justification that people have to rationalize their own self-interest and the basis of their self-esteem, as well as the interests and esteem uh, or, or, or status of their own groups, respectively, people are also motivated to defend, bolster, and rationalize the social systems that affect them. That is, to see the social status quo as good, fair, legitimate, and desirable. And these social systems can, run, uh, can range in size and scope from relationship dyads and families to formal and informal status hierarchies to institutions and organizations and even entire societies. An important uh, starting point of system justification theory is that for members of advantage groups, motives for ego, group, and system justification are generally consistent, complementary, and mutually reinforcing. Whereas for members of disadvantage groups, these motives are often in conflict or contradiction with one another. And different individuals may make different choices about how to resolve these potential conflicts. And so we found, for, for instance, in several studies, that the more African Americans subscribe to system justifying beliefs, such as the belief that inequality in society is fair and necessary, the more they suffer in terms of self-esteem and neuroticism, and the more ambivalent they feel toward fellow in-group members. So because these three uh, different motives are in opposition for members of disadvantaged groups, uh, members of disadvantaged groups are typically um, less likely than members of advantaged groups on average to see the existing system as fair and legitimate, as Larry and other people I think have suggested today as well. However, my colleagues and I have found that under some circumstances, such as when the salience of individual or collective self-interest is relatively low, members of disadvantaged groups can be the most ardent or enthusiastic supporters of the status quo. And this notion is broadly consistent with cognitive dissonance theory, which suggests that the more you suffer, the more you need to rationalize your suffering. Uh, although there's nothing in cognitive dissonance theory per se, to suggest that people will disproportionately resolve conflicts in favor of the social system, which is what we tend to find. Here are data from a, from a survey study involving over 3,000 nationally representative respondents to the general social survey who were asked whether they believed that large differences in uh, income were legitimate and necessary either to get people to work hard or as an incentive for individual effort. And as you can see, uh, a majority of respondents accepted both justifications for economic inequality. Even more surprisingly, perhaps, these justifications were most enthusiastically endorsed by the very lowest income respondents, who showed none of the self-serving or group-serving patterns of attribution that one might expect. These results and others suggest that nearly everyone holds at least some system-justifying attitudes, and that, paradoxically, it's sometimes those who are the worst off who are the strongest defenders of the system. 